Thing. Order! Order! And you are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, Universal Credit was supposed to be the government's flagship welfare programme designed to simplify the benefit system and make work pay. But the scheme, which merges six benefits into one payment, has been beset with problems and delays from the start. Now, a new report from MPs says it's causing unacceptable hardship to many claimants. And a call centre agent who handles people's claims has told Sky News that staff were actually discouraged from helping claimants and were urged to get them off the phone as quickly as possible. Our politics and people correspondent Nick Martin now reports. My name is Baird Tarpley. Uh, for two years I was a telephony agent and case manager at Universal Credit. This is the first time a Universal Credit call agent has openly spoken on camera about life inside the system and it is a damning assessment. I think certainly from a frontline position um, I wasn't particularly confident that Universal Credit was meeting that goal of, of helping people in work and making them better off based on their circumstances. From this call centre in Grimsby, Bayard says changes in the system occurred daily, but not necessarily for the benefit of the claimant. It was things like making it easier for us to process things or making it easier for us to end a call sooner or changing who does what job so that we can quickly get through things. There didn't seem to be a lot of changes that were specifically there to support claimants with particular problems that were being raised. So it was all about getting them off the phone as quickly as possible? So there was there's something called the deflection script, which is within your booth, you have a, a piece of paper that explains what to do when someone calls in. and You were um, encouraged to do everything in your power to get them to hang up the phone and, and do that online. The Department for Work and Pensions said claims of a deflection script were completely false, but added that when handling a query, call agents may use aids to help them effectively process cases, including directing claimants online in relation to their claim. A DWP spokesperson said, we take the training of our call handling staff extremely seriously to ensure they are prepared to handle a range of inquiries regardless of how long they might take. There is no policy to get callers off the phones. He was suffering panic attacks, he didn't want to go to his appointments, he was crying, he was worried about money. Leanne Bailey's dad, Brian, was put on universal credit earlier this year. In July, on the day his next appointment was due, Brian took his own life. He was 59. He was under a lot of pressure from the benefits agency. He was getting constant letters, constant text messages, check your journal, the appointments, having to go in, having to see the work coach. He was just getting fed up. He just said it was like a merry-go-round that he couldn't get off. According to figures compiled by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation and given exclusively to Sky News, working families are suffering. Four million workers are now locked in poverty. That's a rise of half a million in the last five years. This is the highest rate in 20 years. And while the number of those in work is growing, the number of workers in poverty is growing faster. There have been calls to scrap universal credit, although it's likely to undergo further tweaks instead. The full rollout to millions of people is being delayed. The system simply not ready for so many. Nick Martin, Sky News. Well, reporters caught up with the Work and Pensions Secretary, Esther McVeigh, in her constituency this morning. Sky News, any chance of a word about the Public Accounts Committee report today? Well, there is, but I've just got to get into uh, work here. Um, is there a, a culture of denial at the department? Absolutely not. We're speaking with everybody at the moment. Hence, I've started new partnership arrangements with the PAC. Sorry, sorry, could you just say that for me again? I can, but I'm going inside. Any, any chance of a bit of clarity just on, on what the thoughts are? <laughs> Literally the door slamming on her. Uh, let's speak now to Meg Hillier, the uh, Labour Chair of the Public Accounts Committee, whose report did find that universal credit is causing unacceptable hardship and forcing claimants into debt and rent arrears. Um, Meg Hillier, is there anything good about universal credit? Well, actually, the basic principle has got broad cross-party support, but there's a long way between having the idea 
and delivering this big project. And what's been challenging all along is that there's not been a real connection between the principle and the reality of people's lives. So getting paid five weeks in arrears, the debt that that then puts people into, which is often not cleared for a very long time, you know, we're talking people over two years to clear their debt in many cases, is really causing problems. And it's not even really the rollouts at a very, very early stage at this point. Y you said there is a culture of denial in the department. <laughs> the secretary has just denied there's a culture of denial. Well, I was a bit surprised if she didn't just give an interview. It would be amazing if she talked to, to you straight about it, because what we've been picking up from lots of sources is that when they raise concerns with the department, it's just dismissed, as, and often dismissed as just political attacks. This is people like local councils that are trying to deal with the outfall in their area. This is advisors working with claimants, and, of course, the evidence of claimants themselves. And if you're getting your payment five weeks after you, know, you start claiming, you may get an interim payment. That's then taken off your future payments. And the DWP's own figures show that 40% of claimants so far show that they've got financial difficulties still eight or nine months after first claiming. So what is it that you particularly object to here? Because as you, as you said, there's, there's lots of support for the principle behind this. Is it the enactment? Is it the leadership? Where do you see the, the kernel of the fault? Well, it was designed badly and in haste. It was, there was an attempt to introduce it far too quickly. So it was reset in 2013, partly as a result of criticisms from the Public Accounts Committee. Um, but then it's still not really understanding that, you know, the, the, the principle of this, it's like work, so you get paid five weeks in arrears, just doesn't work. If you've got no food in your cupboard, you've got to pay your rent. Or if you're in work and you're planning to pay your childcare, you need that money when you need it. And let's be clear, 20% of people don't even get it in the five weeks. There's a lot of people waiting longer for that money and just getting into debt as a result. It's not supposed to be that you go on to benefits and you get into more debt directly as a result of the system. So it's the system design that is a real problem. And the government's just got to start listening and changing it. By happy coincidence, Universal Credit has rolled out into your constituency mm -hmm. in, in Hackney in London just a couple of weeks ago. What are you hearing from your constituents? Well, it's only a couple of weeks old, so I haven't had um, my next surgery. I, I expect I might get some, some issues. I know there's some very good frontline staff in my local job centre. I'm sure we'll be doing their best to help. But the reality is that whatever they do, the system isn't designed to work. So if you've got very little money, you've got this five-week wait, and that's just too long. Now, the government has said, well, we're providing bits of extra money in the, in the interim. But let's be clear, apart from a bit of housing benefit, the rest is a payment that has to be paid back. That then comes off your benefits for several months after you actually get the, the money. So, so people on low incomes or on benefits, either fully on, on the system on benefits, will have some money taken out of that small amount of money every month to pay back the advance. Could, now, if a system's that badly designed, you have to have that many advances. Could that be fixed? Is that something that you think yes. is a chronic problem or is fixable? It, it is a chronic problem, because if 40% of people are getting, you know, sorry, 60% of people are getting some sort of advance, so over half, then it shows that the system's just not designed right in the first place. And at the very beginning, there were, for example, situations where they were looking at the rent, the payment was four weekly, where many rent payments are monthly, which is a different period of time. So there were disconnects that should have been thought through right from the beginning. And now, even now, we're hearing very directly from people at the front line working with claimants uh, about the costs and challenges. For example, universal support, supposed to help people learn how to manage money with a monthly payment. And what's happening is they're very often giving just debt advice when people are already in debt and it's too late. So the Chancellor could put a couple of billion quid in, into this in his budget. Would that solve the problem? Can well, you just throw money at this? No, no, it's not just about throwing money, but actually that is one of the other big issues here, that George Osborne took £2 billion mm -hmm. out of this. And if you're doing a major change like this, it is not the time to try and make cuts or what they might call efficiency savings, but they're cuts to the system. It means half of all claimants are worse off than they were on their other benefit system that they were on. So, you know, we see those figures from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation about the poverty of people in work, and that's direct, uh, universal credit plays directly into that. So it does need reform. Um, you're the chair of a, of a, a cross-party committee, but you are a Labour MP, and John McDonnell has said he would get rid of universal credit. Is yeah, right? uh, well, absolutely. I mean, Labour's very clear that what we would do is, is pause it and not roll it out any further, really re-examine it again, really get into grips with those the reality of, of what's happening for individuals, and then reform it dramatically. So keep it, but reform it. Well, he uh, uh, well yeah, he, he, well, I mean, I've, talk, I've spoken to John directly about this. Yeah, I mean, when you reform it, it depends how much reform. I mean, we, we, we think it needs quite a radical change, so that Labour's position is that it would be reformed so much that it wouldn't be exactly the same model. But, yeah, I mean, the principle of pooling the benefits is something that we broadly supported. We just have to see if we can make it work. So you would pull them? You wouldn't go back to having six benefits? Uh, well, it would be very difficult system. to unwind that, and frankly, if we get into government, you know, whenever we get into government, it would be a very big project 
to unwind it and put people back onto the separate benefits again overnight. And we have to just assess our priorities. And really, there are probably many more urgent priorities if we can make it work. So that's why the pause would happen to see, could it be made to work so radically reform that it would actually deliver? Uh, or, uh, I suppose the option is always there uh, to get rid of it, but that would be potentially costly and absorb a lot of government time and energy, which, you know, frankly, if we're in power, we might want to do some more positive things, uh, you know, implementing our own new policies as well. OK. Uh, thanks very much. Meg Hilly, Chair of the Public Accounts Committee. Now, Universal Credit is supposed to replace six long-standing social security payments. But since its inception in 2010, it's come in for a lot of criticism. Beset by delays and blamed for the rising of debt and rent arrears and also people using food banks. Well, now a group of influential MPs has said the new system is causing unacceptable hardship and difficulties for the very people it was supposed to help. And it's accused the government of turning a deaf ear. Well, the Department for Work and Pensions say they are already addressing some of the findings in the report. In a moment, we'll speak to some of those affected and a man who helped design the system. But first, eight years on from it being announced, let's take a look at where we are with this huge welfare reform. Universal Credit is a new welfare system that replaces six benefits, including housing benefit, job seekers allowance and working tax credits, with a single monthly payment. The government announced a plan in 2010, saying it would be fully implemented by October 2017. But after repeated delays, it is now unlikely to be fully operational before 2023. By March of this year, the government had already spent £1.3 billion on the scheme. So far, fewer than 1 million people have been enrolled, but eventually around 8.5 million claimants will receive universal credit payments. Critics say that the system has caused hardship for those who are claiming universal credit already, with increases in debt and rent arrears and the number of people making use of food banks. But the government say the system is helping more people into work. Well, let's talk now to Sarah Spohr, a mother and full-time carer to two disabled boys who says the system has left her emotionally broken. We can also speak to former bar manager Neil McVicker, who was forced to claim universal credit after he was diagnosed with a brain tumour in 2016. Also with us here in the studio is Devon Galani, director of the Policy in Practice think tank and one of the team who designed universal credit. And then also with us is Conservative MP Heidi Allen, who is on the Work and Pension Select Committee and has concerns about the system. Thank you all for joining us. Sarah, first of all, explain how one of your sons being on universal credit has affected your family. Um, well, immediately um, we lost £2,500 that first year and then we have a £2,000 recurring loss in our income. Um, apart from the, just to the process of actually applying for it was humiliating and just like I, Daniel Blake, when you go to the job centre, you have to sit there in a room, in fact in the actual reception area, fill, trying to do these online forms, and there were a lot of people whose English wasn't their first language and weren't com computer literate, and we all had to sit there putting our hands up while someone came across to try and help us, and then the system timed out. I, th I just, in the end, I just couldn't do it, and I actually had got a, um, a disability advisor sitting there with me who had taken me because um, she said oh I'm so pleased you're my first universal credit claimant so I'm going to come and help you and neither of us could work it out so I had to go back you know, and did it at home and and then for the first 12 weeks um, the DWP don't consider my child to be disabled even though they've known about it for the, you know since he was three so when we got all the money through they just don't the disability part just vanishes for the first 12 weeks, like a waiting period, and then suddenly, oh, yes, they are disabled again. So that's how come we lost so much money. But as I said, it's 2,000 recurring. And you said you're emotionally broken by it. Just what effect has it had on your family? Um, well, it's difficult enough um, being a carer. It's difficult enough in this hostile environment where people think all disabled people are scroungers. And then you've, and so then, and you've got even less money. Um, you know, I'm constantly in a war with someone to try and get funding or to try and get support for my children. Um, you know, at the moment I'm in, in a drama with Hounslow CCG who don't want to fund um, supporters for my children. But so just to add all that on and then you're applying for PIP and all those sort of things and nothing, you can't do a stick and paste from one form onto another. You have to start all over again because all the wording is different. And I just feel I'm eloquent and able and struggle to do it. And so there are so many people, you know, who just, just wouldn't be able to do it at all. And it's, it's just not okay. 
Let me bring in um, Neil at this stage, because Neil is also with us. Um, Neil, tell us about your experience on Universal Credit. Um, I can recognise a lot of similarities between what I've just heard there. Um, it was really difficult to apply. I applied um, and was sent to the job centre a week or two after my brain surgery. Um, I was um, expected to fill in all these forms and everything. Um, it was really difficult for me, and, and again, I'm eloquent in everything and I can understand it. And it, it Neil, just forgive me for interrupting. <coughs> Did you get any help at the job centre for filling in a form a week after you had brain surgery? Um, not really, no. Um, I did most of it at home. Um, I didn't really get any help or support through the job centre at all the whole way through. Um, my, my work coach did not help me find work. Um, I just took it upon myself and there was a, f a few charities that really helped me. Um, but I didn't have any support through the job centre um, at all, really, to be honest. Devon Galani, I want to bring you in on this. We have spoken to so many people on this programme over the course of Universal Credit being rolled in in different areas. It's the same things we hear time and time again. It's not working, is it? I think the biggest, the hardest thing for me to hear, having been involved in designing Universal Credit way back in 2008, is that I got, I got interested in wanting to change the welfare system, having been in very similar situations uh, to Sarah and Neil, having dealt with the legacy benefit system, where you've got to basically do the same thing three times. You have to go to the job centre, they send you back, you fill in forms, they don't tell you about housing benefit, you might not get all of the support that you're eligible for. And what, um, what the most difficult thing for me to hear is that actually probably your experience of universal credit is very similar to, or trying to go onto it, has been very similar to exactly what it would, would have been under leg the legacy system and the opportunities to try and redesign, redevelop, rethink the system to make it much more supportive for claimants haven't really been taken. That's one of the hardest things. I think the other point is... So the government hasn't done what you told it to do? I think, I think yeah, just frank, frankly, the, the opportunities to try and be, to, to create a system that's much more supportive, uh, it, it's on a journey toward trying to do that, I suppose. I, I suppose if I was being as generous as possible. The, the, the Department for Work, changes have been made to Universal Credit to try and, try and improve it. The government have been trying to do this approach called test and learn, which um, I am optimistic about, but it's certainly taking far too long, and it's taken far too long for both, both Sarah and Neil. Heidi Allen, um, this is a flagship Conservative policy. We've heard numerous uh, examples uh, of how this is not working. Is this not time just to abandon this policy completely and just say universal credit is not working in practice, therefore we get rid of it? No, I don't think it is right. Um, and the NAO, who have been looking, as, as you'll know, intently at universal credit, have said that actually we need to fix it. It is too late to stop it altogether. Um, but all the audience guests that you have here today um, are all absolutely right. For me, there are, and I sit on the Work and Pension Select Committee, so our committee has been looking at it in detail since I was first elected in 2015. And we have constantly pushed out reports saying, fix this bit, fix that bit. And in fairness to the government, they have so far. But I think there are three major things that need addressing. One, this issue of getting onto the system in the first place, being left with a monstrous application form and very little support. Well, the government announced at uh, the conference just recently that Citizens Advice will now have the national contract of universal support, which always should have been there. It's not just an IT system, it should be the support that goes with it, and that has been lacking. So I'm reasonably optimistic that that will get fixed. But the two other things that must be fixed, and I hope to hear it in the budget on Monday, the funding in the system, so the amount of money that people are supported by the work allowances, that needs to be restored to that which it was before the cuts were made in 2015. And the further thing that needs to happen, this five-week wait, although it was cut from six weeks in the budget last year, which cost a billion and a half, brilliant, I think enough now. And I've said this a number of times, both in the House, in the Select Committee and directly to the Secretary of State, I think, given that 60% of claimants now are asking for these advance payments, these loans, the risk of them going into debt as a consequence having to pay back that loan, let's just make that first advance payment, day one, week one, your first payment. We can adjust it at the end of the month when we know what your income's been, but I think we just have to get away from this fundamental design flaw of five weeks. There's a reason that 60% of people want an advance payment, and frankly, I've had enough of it now. We have just got to change the design. Heidi Allen, as you're speaking, Sarah is shaking her head to some of the things you're saying, so I, by all means, Sarah, speak to Heidi. Yeah, the, the CAB taking on the contract that has terrified people in the community that you know I know carers and people you know on low incomes they thought that the CAB was somewhere safe they could go. Citizens Advice Citizen, Bureau. Sorry, Citizens Advice Bureau. Yeah, um, 
they could get, go to get information. I mean, I went a couple of weeks ago to the Citizens Advice Bureau to actually ask about universal credit because I'm thinking of going back to study as a reward for all my years hard work as a carer. And I knew that there was an issue if I was on universal credit. So at the moment, I'm on tax credits. My older son's on universal credit. Now, if, I, if I'm on tax credits, I can go and study and I can get a student loan. However, if I'm on universal credit, I can still go and get a student loan, but it'll be treated as income, in which case I won't be able to afford to study. So, you know, as a long-term benefit, um, you know, to my working life, I won't be able to, you know, it's just ludicrous. Stephen, was it designed like this? I think some of the biggest problems around universal credit are that it wasn't designed like that. It was actually designed as being more generous than the legacy system it replaced. But it's less when, generous. When it, when it went into, that, that was from the design perspective. When it went into government, it was made broadly as generous. So when it, went, when it went into government, money was taken out of it. And actually what's happened back in 2015, just recently, even more money was taken out of the system. So I think one of the core issues of, uh, around universal credit is that it's been conceived in this environment where you've got a, a government that's trying to take £12 billion out of the benefit system. Universal credit itself takes a further £2 billion out of the benefit system. As Heidi says, we've got a budget on Monday and we really hope that actually money goes back into the system, not just to restore the work allowances, but also, as Heidi said, make sure that actually it's a, some of the decisions that have been taken around it are more generous so you're not waiting five weeks for your first payment that's it that's for, for the to, to kind of try and balance the nation's books on the backs of some of the lowest income families in the country is I think a terrible decision to have made at the, at the very outset but it came from this environment of mm. of a government that's tr just uh, and a department that, that's trying to save money at every corner we are getting so many people getting in touch with us with their experiences of um universal credit and thank you so much for um, getting in touch with us about that. Cathy on Twitter says, please do remember my family as you tuck into your Sunday roast this weekend and think how families like mine have no such luxury as we're having to choose between eating one meal a day or heating. Nick's also got in touch on the text with universal credit. Why so long? What needs to be done that takes weeks to resolve that can't be done just in a few days? Uh, Summy on Twitter says, restoring much needed funding after universal credit cuts is vital, but so is tackling problems like the five week wait, which we've been talking about, which plays such an important part in creating hardship and driving people to food banks and other emergency support. And Kat also on Twitter says, give it in advance. Obviously, there are procedures for claiming back over payments when it's needed. Um, if they've been paid uh, too much when they start work, request it back or deduct it from wages. Do keep those comments coming. Heidi Allen, it's worth saying as well, it isn't just an issue, as you've outlined there, about the advances and making sure that people don't get into debt. Other things that people tell us they have problems with universal credit is things like the single payment to couples, which primarily goes to a man. If you're in an abusive yep. relationship, that is a way to another way to control a woman. Of course, men are also in abusive relationships and it could flip the other way. Um, and also, the money for rent goes straight to the claimant and not to the landlord. And for many people, as we've been hearing there, if they're making a choice between heating, eating, buying school sh shoes for their kids, they're going to do that before they pay their rent. And then they get the rent arrears. Surely these need to be addressed as well. Yes, you are absolutely right. If we had a longer programme and I had my, my to-do list, I could give you dozens of things that need fixing at Universal Credit. So surely it needs to be scrapped. It's not working, is it? No, no, I, I disagree because I think for... Um, so, for example, I had an email actually from a constituent this morning that's just moved on to it. And although he found the, the claim process online desperate, as we've heard um, from your um, audience guest today, Actually, when he visited a job centre, he found a brilliant work coach who absolutely sorted him out, found him um, some work and gave him the support that he needed. So it is working um, when, when, it, when all the stars are aligned. But I, and you're right, there are lots of other things, are including the domestic violence issue, which our select committee again has just done a report on. We're asking for those um, single payments to be split, at least the housing and the, and the childcare element should be taken out uh, and given separately, to, principally to the, the wife or the woman, not always. But Hi, often. Alan, let me jump in because Neil, Neil is next to you and he's nodding and shaking and uh, making various right. facial expressions. So I feel, it's, I feel it's right that he should be able to speak to you. Go ahead, Neil. Um, so, I mean, my biggest issue was as a cancer patient recovering, um, I wasn't able to work full time. Um, I submitted my tenancy agreement and I was given with all of my universal credit, I paid my rent and I had £30 a month to live on. Um, when I went to my work coach and told her about this, I was given a voucher for a food bank. Um, in this country, it's such a shame that people are forced to use food banks and everything. And I mean, I, what happened to me, I didn't ask for it. Um, and the only reason I've managed to get through the past year and a bit is because of my fantastic support networks and everything. And 
Um, otherwise, someone would be completely screwed over. I mean, I mean, I'd be homeless if it wasn't for um, my my support, my friends, and my family. Um, and I'm I'm really happy for Macmillan doing this um, with me to to highlight this issue for cancer patients. And I think that's important. I mean, Macmillan are saying up to 26,000 cancer patients, including those who have a terminal diagnosis, are at risk of hardship if this failing system is rolled out. Do you ever think, Devon, that you wished you hadn't come up with this? Because what you're telling us is the idea of universal credit that you came up with has not been rolled out. Does it, does it worry you that so many people are facing hardship? Uh, of course, it's difficult to hear situations like Sarah's and Neil's and many thousands across the country that are in a, a similar situation. But I think you've got to remember a, a lot of the, the challenges that you've just described are exactly the same as under the legacy system, as I said. The, I know, but this was meant to be better. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and exactly. I think that's the frustration. There are elements of it that are better, so about half of people find it, about half of everyone on Universal Credit said it was easier to claim than having to go through lots of different agencies. It's nowhere near high enough, because that's you, you want that to be sort of 95%. The opportunities, as I said, to reimagine the system haven't really been taken. And it's been born in this environment where you're trying to take money out of the system. And a lot of decisions, I feel, have been made to try and um, make it as administratively straightforward or, or, or the same as the system that it's replacing. And rather than taking opportunities to try and reimagine it and, and, and make life uh, much easier for, for, for the people on it. So many people still getting in touch with us with their experiences of universal credit. Thank you ever so much for doing so. This text says, I'm disabled, I'm unfit for work and I have a degenerative disease. So unless a cure is found, I won't ever be able to work again. Yet I've had my disability benefit stopped completely. This is not only discriminatory, it's made my health deteriorate due to being pushed into poverty. Emma on Twitter says the extra pressure on the NHS, the benefit system has caused people fall into depression, anxiety, and in turn that has an impact on physical systems. It's taken three years of fight for me to get what I deserve and I'm simply exhausted. I will stand up for all who deserve better. Uh, Lawrence has got in touch. When you move over to Universal Credit, the system does not show if you are an ESA support group claimant, that means you're deemed unfit for work, but you're still hounded to go into work. And uh, Claire on Facebook says, Universal Credit is a joke. I was 12 weeks with nothing. Had to borrow money off friends. I owe money to everybody. When I told uh, Universal Credit was given to me, I was told absolutely no problem. Thank you ever so much for all of those. Um, if you want to share your experiences of Universal Credit, please do. The hashtag is Victoria Live. Let's have a look at what somebody else has been saying. The chair of the Public Accounts Committee, Meg Hillier, talking about Universal Credit. Well, the DWP has attempted to change um, the rollout of Universal Credit, but has also had money taken out of it, so that's had an impact. So at least half of Universal Credit claimants are getting less money than they were on other benefits. And these are all things that the department should have thought about and they sort of thought about the impact on people. These are people who often, don't, you know, if they're claiming for the first time, won't have any food spare in their cupboards, won't have any money in their purse and need to pay their rent. And if they're waiting five weeks or more for money to arrive, that causes real problems actually you know, makes it very difficult to live. This is obviously all about universal credit and we should say here uh, a committee of all MPs from all backgrounds have roundly criticised universal credit, a system that's meant to make the benefit system simpler, rolling six into one. Tom, I've got to ask you, as, as the only MP on this panel, and of course a Conservative MP, you've been incredibly supportive of universal credit in the past. You said, just to quote, it's unequivocally working locally. What evidence do you have for that? Well, actually, I was in my job centre in Corby only last Friday talking to staff there and, you know, the feedback that I get from talking to them and also from claimants who were there was that universal credit is working and that's reflected in the fact that we've got more women in work, we've got record low youth unemployment in this country at the moment, we've seen unemployment at its lowest level since the 1970s. So something is clearly working Hang and we've got to test and learn. Do you, do you, do you think test... you know better than the Department for Work and Pensions? Because I, I could quote to you what they've said about well, a lack of evidence for it working. Would you like well, me to do what that? I, well, what I know could is I, that I, I, was talking to, I was talking could to I Job Centre Plus staff could last I, Friday who were telling me about centers, how locally could universal I read credit to you what was... what the department a, you, has said? Because what's interesting about this report is it says the government cannot back up its claim that the reform had put more people into work. The department has admitted it will not be able to measure whether it's achieved this objective and confirmed it cannot measure the number of additional jobs in the economy as a result of universal credit. So what do you know from your local job centre that the Department for Work and Pensions doesn't? What I know is that locally unemployment is down very, very considerably, over 50% compared to 2010. 
what we are seeing is a strong economy at the moment that is yielding more new jobs all the time. Do you think universal credit and, is good? And, and, I, and I do think universal credit is an important part of that. And it's right, the principle that work should always pay. And it's important, I think, that we do have a streamlined benefit system. And where things go wrong, of course, you know, individual cases, that should be put right and rectified. And as a Member of Parliament, I help with those sorts of cases should, should we when have they listen, are brought to my attention. Should we have a listen to what the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Esther Mervey, had to say about this? Let's remind ourselves. So we made tough decisions. The Welfare Act went through in 2016 and the country voted for those changes in 2015. So some people could be worse off. That's How much? right on this benefit. Some people could be worse off. So the Secretary of State has admitted that. Meg Hillier has said people are waiting five weeks or more for money to arrive with no food in their cupboards or money. Do you know how much worse off people are under universal credit well, right now? Well, what we've seen, we've seen a process that's speeding up the advances, so people can have advances straight away. We're obviously seeing the processing of universal credit claims sped up as well. And I think when you look at cost of living, you also have to look at a number of other factors. For example, the way in which we've taken millions of people out of income tax altogether, the lowest earners, the fact that we've got the childcare offer that is also making a difference. So universal credit is only one part of that. £1,800 worse off over the year? We've also got a budget next week, of course. On Monday, we've got a budget, and I'm sure that these are all things that are being looked at by the Chancellor. I think it's really important that we do have a safety net. I think it's really important that we encourage people to work where we can. But Tom, and that... Tom, Tom, you're a Conservative. What you're doing is, with universal credit, you're following Gordon Brown, and you are paying benefits to people in work. Do you know what I, as a Conservative, call that? I call it subsidising low wages. And the reason, OK, we've got higher employment, but we've also got shatteringly low productivity. We have got appalling training. We have disgraceful uh, levels of the use of IT in uh, lower ranking industry and whatever. And the reason is that we subsidise work. In other words, the taxpayer is paying to let There's employ... massive political consensus around the idea... Well, but it's, it's wrong. Um, I believe in John McDonnell yesterday. Wages. In fact, yeah, in fact, yeah, what, what, people, what people actually object to, and I don't think this is right either, but where people tend to object, it's to people actually getting paid without going into work. I mean, the, the thing is, there's two different things here, aren't there? There's the concept of universal credit, which most people would agree with, simplifying benefits, trying to help people back into work. Most people, maybe not David on this particular case, but I suspect most other people it's wrong. in politics. It's wrong, but on wrong, the other wrong. hand, but on the other hand, there's the practicalities. And a few things have happened with universal credit which have been really, really difficult. You know, George Osborne taking three billion pounds out, the six week wait, which I know some money has gone back into improving, waiting for, you know, waiting for monthly payments, paying rent to people directly instead of to housing, uh, instead of to landlords. And all of those things, whilst I understand the intention behind them, they are showing that they are actually causing a lot of hardship in a lot of parts of the country. And actually, it's good that the government has slowed things down, but I think sometimes you've got to put your hands up and say there are serious problems so, here. So is that not fair to just come back on? I know Miata, your, your foundation mm -hmm. looks at this, and I'll come to you in just a moment. But you don't seem to be admitting any fault with this, whereas actually there does seem to be fault. Well, what we've seen is where issues have been raised and where there's been particular challenges, we've addressed those challenges, for example, around the advances in terms of the speeding up of the processing of claims. And in my own constituency, we were one of the very early rollouts. And what I've found is that as time has gone on, there have been less concerns brought to my attention about processing as the process has been improved. And there's the test and learn approach that has been taken in the department. And I welcome the fact that we are responsive to that feedback and that we ad adapt the system as is necessary. So you don't recognise this fortress mentality then, as is described by the, of the department. Uh, Miata? Well, I think what we're seeing here is exactly the fortress mentality. So the evidence base is that this thing isn't working. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the argument that somehow it's leading to an increase in employment there is absolutely no evidence to kind of back that up. In the end, the problem with universal credit is not the principle that you have a single benefit that eases the transition in and out of work. It's the fact that a huge chunk of money was taken out of it by the Chancellor in 2015, which makes it unworkable and it makes it, frankly, cruel. But Labour are having it both ways on this, and I recognise you're not a spokesperson for Labour. A spokesperson for Labour. You, but you have worked for Ed Miliband. You have expressed, uh, how should I put it, interest or support for some of Jeremy mm. Corbyn's policies, certainly economically. When they take our policies. Well, OK. <laughs> However, we are, in all seriousness, people are scratching their heads as to what Labour would actually do. Because on one hand, you've got John McDonnell saying, get rid of universal credit. But they're making political cap capital out of this, aren't they? Because up until recently, Labour supported universal credit. Well, so, the, I mean, I don't think they're making political capital out of it. I think they're looking at the fact that actually for millions of people, uh, 
this this benefit, if it is rolled out, is going to make them substantially worse off. And they're saying this is not acceptable, it's not tenable. Although and we that, should I say think... that not everybody is worse off under this. But and more then, people there... will be worse off. With the changes that are coming in train, there will be more people who are worse off than people who benefit from it. And that's the bottom line. So you cannot see that. You cannot. It see... may be in the short term, though, but the, obviously the ambition which Labour got behind was that universal credit made it easier and got more people into work. And there is nothing wrong with that principle. So, you know, the idea of a single income is not that dissimilar to the idea of a basic income that organisations like us have been advocating. In all seriousness, do you actually know what Labour would do? So, Are I you mean, clear? No, so I think, so they absolutely need to set out what their position is on this. I think it will be very hard for them to scrap universal credit uh, just because it would have gone far too down the track for them to do that. I think there are good things about it, the idea of a single payment that they need to take on board, but critically you've got to ensure that you're putting enough investment in it so you're not penalising the poor when you're trying to balance the books, which is what we've essentially had to do. Deep sigh to my left, I'll come back to you in just a moment. Nushka, your ear to the ground with the Labour folk. Any clearer as to what they would actually do? Well, I think a lot of discussions around this are picking up on that issue. You know, you can't just loosely say you're going to scrap universal credit and not, not know exactly what you're going to put in its place. And as David pointed out, this started under the Labour government. Actually, Gordon tax Brown. credits yeah. were all about trying to ease um, this change. But I think what Labour surely will do, or, or will at least say they're going to do, is to take away some of those particularly crunch points through the universal credit system. At the moment, as you, as you know, know, they're that. saying we could just get rid of, you know, we can just get rid of it. I think that's actually quite a dangerous thing to say because it's way too complicated for that. But that doesn't mean it doesn't mean need drastic change. David? The problem is when both political parties agree on something, it's almost always wrong. There's an abs it's It's a pretty well universal rule. And I'm, I really do come back to this fundamental point. We do have, by European standards, very, very low levels of unemployment. We also have appalling record of productivity. We have spectacularly low wages. And the government and the taxpayer are subsidising this. And it was the Victorians confronted this in what's called the Spenum land system. And they abolished it. And it put in because ratepayers were subsidising farmers. And it put immense, if you need the labour, you've then got to pay the proper price for it. And until we sort out this fundamental problem, we're we're going so, to have increasing and increasing welfare with less and less so, return. David, Final point, may I ask you, quickly? You're you right will. that there is low pay and we need to tackle it, and there are big structural reforms we need to put in place to do that. But in the meantime, people are being squeezed and they're oh, suffering. So, and the idea you're that we right, sit so, back and say the, it's okay no, 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 no. is just know, not I have not said it's okay. To be fair, I didn't say it was I okay. I have not said it's okay. There was a prediction clearly, of the future. Clearly, there are huge practical problems. But what I am saying is the principle of universal benefits is wrong. It's wrong, wrong, wrong. And we well, I think we're clear it. on what you think. Yeah. Thank you for that, David. The government has been accused of being in denial about the hardship caused by changes to the benefits system. A committee of MPs warned that universal credit is leading to increased debt, rent arrears and the use of food banks. The government says it will consider the committee's findings. Our deputy political editor, John Pienaar, reports. As fast as supplies come in, they go out faster. Is universal credit driving more people to use food banks? The people who run them seem to think so. You only have to ask. Universal credit's been rolled out here since December last year. We've seen our numbers at this food bank more than double since then. Uh, we're finding that lots of people who are claiming universal credit, they're getting universal credit, many of them are working, but they're still being driven into debt, struggling to feed themselves and their families. Tin tomatoes. The need's undeniable, the need for help, putting food on the table, millions badly short of cash with mounting debt. And in today's report, a cross-party committee of MPs joins the queue of critics. The MPs condemn what they call the culture of denial at the Work and Pensions Department, around the flaws in the system. They call it a fortress mentality, fending off critics and complaints. But there's a wealth of evidence, the report says, of delays in making payments, pushing people into debt and having to rely on food banks. The MPs demand a step change in attitude to universal credit's failings, with faster payments to more claimants. These are people who often, don't, if they're claiming for the first time, won't have any food spare in their cupboards, won't have any money in their purse and need to pay their rent. And if they're waiting five weeks or more for money to arrive, that causes real problems. 
Lauren's a single mother from Newcastle. She bears witness to the accusation that delayed payments are causing real hardship. The delay getting your benefit, what was that like? It was horrible. There was a five or six week delay where I was relying on friends, family and food banks in particular. And using food banks, what was that like? Embarrassing. It was hard to go in and admit that you didn't have enough money to f even feed yourself, mm. like because it's a, a necessity. Mm. So it was very hard. Stories like Lawrence haven't persuaded ministers the system's at fault. We are listening and we will continue to make improvements as we go along. But as I said to you, at the end of the day, what we want to do is to make sure we have a welfare system which of course supports uh, people who need that support. It's fair to taxpayers, it's sustainable, but ultimately helps people into work. The Chancellor's keen to keep the benefit bill down, but he's facing a chorus of demands for a rethink and more money. With his neighbour, Theresa May, now promising an end to austerity, the betting is that the Chancellor will somehow find more money in next week's budget to show he's listening. The trouble is that critical chorus has grown so loud it'll be very hard to satisfy. Universal Credit was designed to produce losers and winners to prompt more people to work. But it hasn't all gone to plan, and now Tory MPs and ministers are feeling up against it too. John Pienaar, BBC News. Now, the Work and Pension Secretary, Esther McVeigh, has admitted the new Universal Credit system needs to change after a damning report by MPs. But she rejected the Public Accounts Committee's claim that her department had a systematic culture of denial and what the report called the desperate hardship for claimants during the current rollout of the reform, which combines six existing benefits into one. Here's our political correspondent, Michael Crick. Eight years after its launch, Universal Credit's reputation is dire. I've worked in the job centre for 38 years. And Despite government I've efforts like benefits. this video. So for me, Universal Credit is the best benefit Ever. Ever. That's not quite how single mother Justine Pyatt sees it. She says universal credit pushed her into debt and forced her to give up her job. It's hard enough to go to work as a single parent of a one-year-old and an eight-year-old as it is, let alone trying to work this work out a system that not even the, the people that work there don't even understand how the system works. Yet they expect you to understand and they, they've just, they've, they've failed me. They've completely failed me and consequently I've lost my job because of it. Universal Credit is causing unacceptable hardship. Labour and Tory MPs jointly said today. And unless the problems and funding are tackled, that hardship will continue. Many people are being forced into debt and to use food banks, the MPs say, because of the payment delay after being switched from other benefits. Yet Universal Credit, it was hoped, would simplify the benefit system and make work worthwhile. The government had bold aims. It would get more people into work, it would make work pay, and instead what it's got is assistance putting people into debt with um, over around 40% of people, according to the DWP's own work, still having financial problems eight to nine months in um, after receiving their first payment. So it isn't doing what it said on the tin by a long way, and it really needs to be sorted out. Well, if you want to ask us some questions, I'll make you a cup of tea or coffee. Work and Pension Secretary Esther McVeigh seemed at first to be avoiding the cameras, but outside her constituency office, she admitted to ITV News some claimants are worse off. For some, because it's a totally different benefit, the amounts are different and some it is going to be lower. I've never ever shied away from that. I'm a straight talking person. But what we've said is that extra support to get people into work is working. A thousand more people into work each and every day. And we always look after the most vulnerable and we're doing that by helping a million more disabled people. But can the DWP really switch another four million? to universal credit, MPs ask, without more hardship. The pressure's on Monday's budget to ease the strain. Michael Craig. Here, the perceived failures of the flagship welfare reform programme Universal Credit were laid bare today. A parliamentary committee said the government was turning a deaf ear to concerns despite the unacceptable hardship that many are going through. Well, with that in mind, that you might expect then that the minister in charge would be provided to talk to journalists, but that was not the case. 
So we set out to find her and ask what is being done to help claimants who say they have been left struggling. Should we see the bow -wow? Universal credit is supposed to be simple, but it has made Justine's life much more difficult. Under the new system, she has to pay her childcare costs up front and then claim them back. When the government refused to reimburse her because she submitted the form a day late, she found herself in debt and could no longer afford to go to work. Just please, just please, please listen and hear us. Like, this is just not fair. This is just not fair. This is failing people that actually want to, want to work, people that want people that want to earn money themselves so they can pay their own bills so they're not reliant on the benefit system yet yeah, yet yeah. okay parliament has now been officially notified of the distress caused to people like justine and, a, and the 50 percent rise in the use of food banks in the places where universal credit has been tested the Commons Public Accounts Committee found that a fortress mentality at the Department for Work and Pensions was failing claimants who were being caused unacceptable hardship. The MPs went on to condemn a culture of denial at the Ministry, which they say won't make the situation any better. In her constituency today, the Work and Pensions Secretary rejected those criticisms, but acknowledged that the new system will leave some worse off. For some, because it's a totally different benefit, the amounts are different and some it is going to be lower. I've never ever shied away from that. I'm a straight talking person. But you're making working families worse off. Isn't that the exact opposite of what a Conservative government should be doing? Well, I don't agree with what you've said there. We're making working families and families better off by supporting them into work. And then when they can't work, we support those people. Your Prime Minister used to talk about how the Conservative Party was becoming the nasty party. Don't you worry that what you're doing is making the Tory party the nasty party once again? I don't believe that. The Tory party has always been about support, it's been about aspiration and it looks after the most vulnerable. There have been hints that next week's budget will contain measures to ease the pain of universal credit. But for many of those who the new system was supposed to help, oh, the damage is already done. Geraint Vincent, News at 10, Tatton. Well, as Geraint mentioned there, many will be looking to see what next week's budget has in store for those who receive universal credit. Our political correspondent, Libby Vina, joins me live now to discuss that and much more. Is there likely to be more money forthcoming on universal credit? Well, I think, uh, Alistair, when the Prime Minister announced earlier this month that austerity is over, she delivered what in sporting parlance might be called a hospital pass to the <laughs> Chancellor, Philip Hammond. The fact is, although public borrowing has come down, debt is still sky high. He has very little room for manoeuvre, very little cash to splash about. That said, I think Universal Cat credit is an obvious candidate. Whatever the merits of the system, I think clearly some claimants are suffering untold misery because they're having to pay uh, for things up front and they're not being reimbursed. I think the new system where six benefits are rolled into one does rely on a well-oiled government machine and it's simply not delivering. So I think there will be more money to help that system work better. I'm not sure exactly how much money and how effective it actually will be, because there do seem to be a lot of fundamental flaws in that system. Broadening it out, then, as I implied that I, I would do, what are you expecting to see in Philip Hammond's budget? Well, I've been speaking to the Institute of Directors, and they say there are obviously going to be many demands on the Chancellor, but they really say he must listen to the voice of business, particularly struggling high street businesses who say that they need help with their costs, particularly business rates. And I think the evidence is that he has been listening to them. I think there will be some help in that regard uh, when the budget is delivered on Monday. All this against the backdrop of Brexit um, looming over it. The Chancellor does not know what kind of deal Mrs May is going to get, if indeed she is going to get a deal. So I think it's fair to say that this budget is being delivered against a background of economic uncertainty unparalleled in modern times. So while there are many people urging him to be bold, I think his instinct really will be, and the reality is, he has to hedge his bets. Fascinating stuff, just two and a half days away. Libby, thank you very much.